You will probably be aware, if you've been watching my videos, that I'm a bit of an Amiga fan. And whilst, whilst playing games and doing videos for the games of these systems, I have made reference to the chipsets in the various different machines, the uh, OCS, ECS and AGA chipsets. And I was asked by letters from the left if I would do a video explaining the differences, which is what I'm going to try and do here. So we have got the Amiga 500 this one has the uh, OCS original chipset uh, here we've got an Amiga 40030 and this is my Amiga 1200 tower system I have shown this in another video I'll link to that one in case you've missed it but that is a 1200 with oodles of gubbins and things which we may if I can fit it in get to have a look inside later as well as doing a, a comparison of the chipsets I would like to show actual gameplay footage so you can see what the differences are um, between the different chipsets in terms of what the games look like. Okay, um, give me a moment and I will open these little babies up. Okay then, this is the Amiga 500 motherboard. It is the, uh, the original 500 as opposed to the 500 Plus. Let's have a closer look at the chips here. This is the Agnes, or more specifically the Fat Agnes, built by Moss Technologies, uh, owned by Commodore, well I say owned, they were bought out by Commodore after Commodore basically ran them into bankruptcy by buying lots of chips from them and not paying them. Very devious. So the Agnes, it controls access to chip RAM, which is accessible by both the CPU and the sound and graphics custom chips. It contains subcomponents called the Blitter and the Copper. The Blitter is for uh, graphics manipulation shifting large chunks of graphical data around quickly while the copper was used for um, color gradients like you'll see in some games. The original Agnes was able to address 512k of RAM while later ones like this, the fat Agnes, it was still 512k of chip RAM which was accessible by the custom chips but it could also address an extra 512k of what was called fast RAM this was only accessible by the CPU, which meant the CPU wasn't sharing it with the custom chips, effectively making the machine run faster. Though you wouldn't really notice on a 500, on, on later machines or accelerated machines, it made a big difference. There was a later variant called the Fatter Agnes, which could address one megabyte of chip RAM. And this appeared in the 500 Plus and the 600. Okay, here we have the Denise chip. This controls video timing. It allows synchronizing with external video signals used for things like uh, gen locks and chroma keys, you know, where you uh, overlay live footage over background graphics or uh, conversely, you put video you know, text over video footage for titling and things like that. Uh, the Amiga was used a lot for that kind of thing in TV and amateur videos. It also controls planar video data. This was the method that the Amiga used for manipulating graphics. Um, it had some special graphics modes like extra half bright and hold and modify, known as ham. These were very clever methods of getting more colors out of the hardware than you could otherwise expect by using pixel and data manipulation methods. Basically, calculating the color of one pixel by m manipulating the information regarding the pixel next to it. It did create some weird artifact, but um, it was very, it was effective. It was a good way of getting a lot of color out of a machine that originally wasn't intended to produce that many. Uh, extra half bright would take a 32-bit color mode and dimming down the colors could produce 64, effectively 64 on screen, on screen colors, while hold and modify could produce up to 4096 colors. This is the Paula chip. Uh, this is the audio output. It has four DMA-driven 8-bit PCM sample sound channels. I won't go into too much detail of what that means, but basically, yeah, 8-bit eight eight audio samples. You've got two channels with left and right outputs. It, it, it would mix two, ch two audio channels into the left output, two into the right output. And it is possible to combine audio channels together to produce a 14-bit output, which is something I did a lot using the music software Octomed 
sound studio the uh, the CPU would handle all the mixing of the audio and you could have umpteen tracks regardless of how many actual audio channels there were you could just mix tracks together the CPU would handle mixing them together and would then output them in 14 bit which was great this is the Gary chip uh, this handles access to the data bus and the disk drive in earlier models and it then later in the 4000 it handles access to the IDE port so that is the original chipset known as OCS it appears in the Amiga 1000, the 500, the 1500, the 2000 and the CDTV. Now I don't have an example here of the ECS, the enhanced chipset, though it is largely the same as this. The major difference is the Super Agnes, which, as I'm reading from Wikipedia, says it could address 2 megabytes of chip RAM. I don't recall that being the case, so uh, I'll, I'll stand corrected if anyone knows otherwise. Uh, it supports higher screen resolution modes. The blitter can copy larger chunks of graphics data and move those around, and it has the ability to display sprites in border areas of the screen which the original Agnes couldn't do and that really is the main difference you, you won't tell an awful lot of difference in watching a game on an OCS or an ECS you you won't notice an awful lot of difference it was a very very minor alteration it was an upgrade but really you wouldn't have noticed Okay, this is the motherboard of an Amiga 1200 that I just happen to have sitting around. Uh, in it, you will find the AGA chipset, AGA standing for Advanced Graphics Architecture. In the US, it was originally known as the AA chipset for Advanced Architecture, but the name was changed when it was released in Europe. So here we have the Alice chip. This replaces the Agnes from the earlier machines, it is improved to handle the full 32-bit data bus, where earlier Amigas were known as 16-stroke 32-bit. They had some 32-bit architecture, but the data bus was 16-bit. The Alice fixes that by having the full-width data bus. It also doubles the bus's clock speed. This is the Lisa chip, which replaces the Denise in the earlier chipset. It has support for 8-bit planar data fetches my god that sounds nerdy basically faster graphics more colors the original chipset as i mentioned could handle 64 colors in extra half bright mode and 4098 in hold and modify this chip can do 256 colors in uh, normal screen modes like the kind of things you would have in games uh, while it can do up to 262,144 colors in what they call ham 8 good for graphics programs photo manipulation and whatnot too slow for games but it does look very nice on screen this is the gale chip it appears in the 600 and 1200 and it replaces the gary chip in the earlier models it manages chip ram the ide bus and connections for memory cards now i'm not sure if that would be like internal memory cards or memory cards using the pcm cia slot which is uh, this thing here that you didn't get on um 500 and basically just appeared in the 600 and 1200 so yes, the largest differences, most notable differences between the AGA chipset and the earlier chipsets were the increased number of colors and the 32-bit um, data bus compared with the 16 in the earlier models. Uh, it doesn't sound like an awful lot on paper and really it, it wasn't a massive improvement but it was a, a much more noticeable improvement between ECS and AGA than say between OCS and ECS you really could tell the difference when you were playing a game that made use of the extra capabilities and uh, I will be showing you some examples in a little while this is the CPU for the 1200 it's the Motorola 68 EC 020 not even a full 020 the memory management on these doesn't function uh, let's pan back so you can see just how small that is there so that quite small this is the inside of the Amiga 4000 and what a beast it is let's get in for a closer look this is the Zorro 3 expansion board you, you've got three Zorro 3 
slots which incorporate PCAT style slots. You could use a bridge board plugged into these enabling you to use PCAT style expansion cards. I am not that familiar with this. I don't know which part is the bridge board which is the PCAT and which is the Zorro 3 or if it is all, all Zorro 3 or what. I, I don't know. Uh, this is the video slot there. I don't know if the video card would just go in this part or this part or all of it. Couldn't tell you, I'm afraid. Shows how much I know about these. So then looking at the rest of the, the motherboard, we've got memory expansions here. I'm not entirely sure how much memory is in this little beastie, but it's certainly very adequate. Batteries for the battery backed up clock. This I think is modded. I don't think this is, is standard, but it certainly does the job. We've got the Alice here. Lisa Super Buster don't know anything about that I'm sure someone can tell me looking around the back here trying to get some light on it you can see there's a socket there for a floating point unit there isn't one fitted obviously and we've got the 68EC030 basically a, a 68030 without memory management running at 25 megahertz and we've got a Ramsey Okay, the Ramsey manages fast RAM and generates addresses during DMA transfer, uh, direct memory access transfer. Very nerdy. Yes, I'm not even going to try and go into more detail about that because I just don't know. Right at the back there, I don't know if you can see it, is a fat Gary, which, uh, like the Gary in the 500 on, on the original chipset, gives access to the, the data bus and the disk drive, and in the 4000 it also uh, controls the IDE port. Okay, finally, without actually taking the whole thing apart, I want to show you the CPU in my 1200 tower, as we looked at the CPUs in the others. That, there, this big, big beast, is the 68060. CPU made by Motorola. In terms of power, if a uh, if a 1200 with the 68020 is the same power or same kind of capability as a PC with a 286, the 030 being about the same as a 386, and the 040 being the same as a 486, this is in terms of ability pretty much on a par with a 75 megahertz Pentium One. Definitely very comparable and it gets damned hot. There is no cooling, no heatsink, no fan. How it doesn't just blow itself up, I don't know. But I've had this thing for a long time, 15 years or so, 12, 15 years, and it's been ultra reliable. It is a wonderful thing. And uh, could probably expect if I was to sell that on its own, just the accelerator board with nothing on it, on eBay, I would expect that to sell for about £300, so uh, the whole machine with all the expansions and everything, quite a bit. It's my baby! <laughs> okay, moving on. Alright, quick example of the, the kind of racing game you could expect on a ECS or OCS Amiga. This is obviously Jeff Crammond's Formula One Grand Prix. Uh, you couldn't play it like this on a 500 or whatever because of the CPU I've got, but it shows the graphical capabilities of the uh, the chipset in terms of the amount of colours and detail and whatnot. You wouldn't get this frame rate, but everything else, yeah, it, this is OCS. Just have a quick blast. We won't spend a lot of time here because I am running out of time. Okay. Let's try something different to demonstrate the AGA chipset. Okay, this is a demo and a very broken demo of Alien F1, it was originally called in this demo version. It later became known as Virtual Grand Prix. I don't have the full game. This demo is incredibly broken. I will lose control very soon. Um, but you can see the difference in graphical capabilities. A lot of this is down to the CPU, but it, it's all about the depth of colour, really. You could not do this on OCS, ECS hardware. One last thought, I was going to do a demonstration of the different CPU capabilities of the various Amigas I've got here, but I'm out of time, so I'm going to do that on a separate video.